Welcome back, Macromolecules Day. Super Yay. exciting. So today we're going to talk about the building blocks of life. And this is one of my all-time favorite topics because if you know the macromolecules of life, you truly understand why things behave that the way that they do. So we're going to talk about some detail. If we're writing stuff, you should write stuff. And if you have any questions, let us know. All right, let's get started. All right. So today we're going to be talking about macromolecules, and they all fall, fall under this class of chemistry called organic chemistry. So what is organic chemistry? So this word organic simply means that it has to be carbon-based. Okay. So we know that all of the macromolecules of light that we're going to talk about have a carbon backbone or a carbon skeleton. And that's important because that carbon skeleton helps to explain why there's so much diversity, even though all living things are made up of the same four things. Okay, so what is it about carbon that makes it so special? Like, why is carbon the backbone for all of these molecules? Well, carbon has this interesting and, um, what's a better way of saying it? It has a predictable behavior pattern. Carbon always wants to be bonded in a very specific way. And if you look at the pictures down here on the bottom, you'll notice that carbon typically wants to be bonded to... Four different things. Okay. Um, so carbon likes to form four bonds. And that's because it has four valence electrons, and so it's looking for four more in order to be happy and stable. Yes. Um, so one important thing to note is, yes, carbon wants to make four bonds, but they don't all have to be single bonds. I know, that's weird. Carbon just likes to be stable, and any way that it can become stable, it'll yeah. do it. So sometimes it's going to be linear, and we uh -huh. have some examples here of like ethane and, and propane, how mm -hmm. these guys are all linear, so they're all single bonded. But you'll also notice that there are some cases, like for instance, if you look at um Butene, or you look at benzene or cyclohexane, um, or sorry, not cyclohexane, you'll see that there are some double bonds. And those mm -hmm. double bonds um, actually change the structure of the compound. Now, are we expecting our kids to memorize all of this stuff? No. The take-home message is we want to know that ca using carbon, you can form molecules in a whole bunch of different shapes and sizes. Yeah, and we'll, later on you'll notice, especially when we start to talk about lipids, those double bonds versus single bonds are become really important to help us predict yeah. Um, how things are going to behave. Okay. So we should probably talk a little bit about what that word a macromolecule means since we're spending all day talking about it. So yeah. let's break it down real quick. So that prefix macro means? Really big. Big. Like that guy's muscles. Really, really big. Or my own muscles. Um, yes. So very, very big molecules is what we're talking about today. And there's four main classes of these molecules, and they are? So we have carbohydrates, okay. which are going to be the very first macromolecules that we're going to discuss. So we're going to tell you them in the same order that we're going to discuss them. Then second, we have lipids. Lipids. And those are the only two that we're going to discuss in today's um, video. But in our next video, we're going to hit the last two. And the last two are? Proteins and nucleic acids. So those are our big four, all living things made up of these these four guys in various structures and various ratios or, or um, various organizations. So we're going to talk about all of those things in greater detail. So um, there are some general principles that we want to go over before we start talking about the specifics of these four groups. So the first is to understand how we build these really big molecules. Um, another name for macromolecules is? Polymer. And the prefix poly means many. So obviously if a macromolecule is really big, it's going to be made up of many things or lots of stuff. And if it's made up of many things, that means that it must have building blocks that are a lot smaller, and those building blocks have a name. Yeah, we call the building blocks of a polymer monomers. And that prefix mono means? One. So how many monomers does it take to make a polymer? Um, it can take anywhere from two to thousands. Yeah. And now when we go from a monomer to a polymer, there's a special name for that type of chemical um, event that has taken place because mm -hmm. it creates something unique. And the name for that is dehydration synthesis. Um, so if we look at this first word, dehydration, it tells us actually a little bit about how we're going to put these monomers together into polymers. So the way we're going to do it is we are going to literally dehydrate the molecules. We are going to take out water. All right, so that's what this picture is showing you right here. I have several monomers. I've got one monomer over here. Monomer, monomer, and I want to connect this one more monomer on to make a nice long polymer. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to take out water. Yeah, and so we need to take out water or extract water in order to form a covalent bond. That's the key. 
So when we're making things bigger, so when we're going from smaller things to larger things, we have to remove water in order to ensure that that covalent bond will form. It's really important you need to make sure that you know that. So let's talk some more about dehydration synthesis. How are we actually creating a water? Okay, so the way that we're going to create that water is we're going to remove an H from one molecule and an OH from another molecule. Okay, and so when we do that, my H and my OH are going to combine, and when they combine, obviously we know that two H's and one O equals... HOH or H2O. Which is water. So that's what we're always going to form whenever we're looking to form a covalent bond. And again, we want to make sure that we keep that straight because it's easy to forget that. When we're going small to big, we have to remove a water in order to make that covalent bond happen. But this doesn't just happen randomly. It's not like water is just randomly coming out of molecules and joining them together. In order for dehydration synthesis to occur, it's going to take an input of energy mm -hmm. as well as a special type of molecule that helps orchestrate this whole chemical reaction. And those things are called enzymes, and they're going to be really important. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about enzymes in our next movie, but for right now, all you need to know is that it requires a lot of energy to do this chemical process, and so there needs to be an input, and we'll talk about that energy input a little later on in the year, but you guys should already know because we've talked about metabolism, right? Metabolism is the process of utilizing energy in order to drive chemical reactions to maintain homeostasis, so that shouldn't be new. But what you don't know is that there's actually a key player that's going to limit the amount of energy that's actually necessary in order to drive the chemical reaction to completion. Right, and that key player is enzymes. Yeah, and so just a reminder again, this process is called dehydration synthesis because we're taking out water and it, it can uses, also be called uh, it can also be called a condensation reaction because the water is condensing out of the molecule. And but it is important to emphasize that it is using energy and it does need an enzyme in order to um, moderate the process. All right. Now that we've talked about that, there's our enzyme. Ooh, there's our enzyme. Very exciting. Awesome. Look at that enzyme. So now we're going to talk about how we break down a polymer back into those monomer pieces. So we're going to do just the opposite of when we put the polymer together. We're going to do something called hydrolysis. So will you tell us a little bit about that, Ms. Cook? Yeah, so hydro basically means water, mm -hmm. and lysis means to break apart. Mm -hmm. So hydrolysis, if it is the opposite of a condensation reaction or dehydration synthesis, instead of making water, we're just going to break it back up into what it originally was, one hydrogen, and then 1OH so that we can break the covalent bond and restore the individual monomers that were initially bound together. Right. So that's what we see in the picture. We see water being added back in and the polymer being broken apart. And something else to remember too is this is still a chemical reaction, so do we still need energy? We still need energy and we still need enzymes, and that's good. Otherwise, every time we drink water, everything would just fall apart. That's right. So this is still going to be regulated. It's not happening on its own. The body has to figure out when it wants these things to happen, um, and we do that via homeostasis. Right. So let's recap all of these different types of reactions. So again, here I see a monomer plus a monomer being put together into a polymer. Polymer. So we're going from small to big, and I've noticed that water is coming out, so what kind of chemical reaction is this? This is going to be your dehydration synthesis or condensation reaction. But in order for this to happen, what do we still need? We can't forget about them. Um, you're still going to need energy and enzymes. Okay. And just a reminder, because some people might be confused, where is that water coming from? That water is coming out of the molecules. Remember, we're going to take an H from one monomer and an OH from another monomer in order to form that water. And then we're going to join them together in a covalent bond. Right. Super important. Now, if we look at the bottom half, you'll notice that we have the opposite reaction happening. We know that it's the opposite because instead of taking water away, we're adding it and we're starting big and we're going to end up with um, product that's going to be much smaller than what we started with. So we're starting with a polymer in this case, mm -hmm. which is a fancy word for a macromolecule, and we want to make some monomers. In order to do that, we're going to lyse water. So we're going to use a hydrolysis or hydrolysis reaction. Okay. And we're going to restore the hydrogen and the OH on those original monomers to break the covalent bond. 
Um, but in order to do this, we are again going to need energy and enzymes in right. all ways. Good thing we have that metabolism. Yeah, we don't want this stuff just happening on its own. We want to be in charge. We want to make sure that we're doing things that make sense for our body and that make sense in the environment that we're actually in. So here's an example of dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis with some actual molecules drawn in so we can see what this looks like when it's all written out. So here's the most important thing. We don't want you to freak out. Mm -hmm. Look for the things that you know. So I right away, I notice that we have some ring-like structures. And initially on the uh, left-hand side of that equation, on, I notice that those ring-like structures are not paired together. So there's not a covalent bond. So I know that those two are separate, mm -hmm. so I have two monomers. But I also notice that a water is being formed, and we're pulling a hydrogen yeah. from one of those monomers, and we're pulling an OH from another one of those monomers in a condensation or a um, dehydration reaction. And if we look on the right-hand side of that equation... Yeah, what we see here is now they're connected to each other. So what kind of bond did we form? We formed a covalent bond, the strongest bond. Excellent. Now, if we look down at the bottom for hydrolysis, again, look for what you know. Okay. So, are my monomers bound together? Mm, it looks like over here they are bound together. They are joined. But then, when I look over here, they're separate. And if you look on the left-hand side of that arrow, you'll notice that we're doing what with the water? We are adding water in. Because we want to replenish the oxygen, I'm sorry, the hydrogen and the OH so that we can remove the covalent bond so that we're going from big to little. Right. All right, so now we are finally ready to dive in and start talking about our first macromolecule group, one of my favorites, carbohydrates. carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they have some general characteristics that we should probably talk about. Um, so let's talk about their chemical formula first. Okay, so their chemical formula is they always are made up of these three different elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And they, they're made up of these things in a very unique ratio. Yeah, the ratio you're always going to find these in is a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1 in a carbohydrate. So let's give you an example. So glucose is a really important um, mm -hmm. carbohydrate for yep. living things. It provides energy for us to do all the things that we do. So the chemical formula for glucose is c 6 h 12 Six. So let's see if that fits the ratio that we know carbohydrates should be in. It does fit. Awesome. So that's a great example. Carbohydrates, specifically glucose, that's a chemical formula that you do want to know. What I always tell people is CHO-6126. Easy mm -hmm. to remember um, because we're going to be talking about it a lot. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about what the function of carbohydrates is in living things. So the main thing that carbohydrates do for us, and we just mentioned this with glucose, is they are our energy source. Yeah, they're a quick way to get energy to get things done um, in the body. Right, and they're going to be the direct input for cellular respiration, which we'll talk about later in the year, which is how we get that energy. Yeah. But then they have a couple other things that yeah, they do. Yeah, and this is tricky. So not only can we use them for quick energy, we could also use them for quick energy storage. Okay, so energy storage for kind short of a term. short term mm -hmm. okay energy storage in the short term that's Got really it. important to make sure that if we have to do a long-term storage we're not going to store it as a carbohydrate because it's okay. not very efficient and then the last thing is carbohydrates can also be used for structural support okay for structure and we'll talk about um, some examples. So let's talk about some general examples of carbohydrates. Generally, when people think about carbs, they think sugars. Okay. Um, so again, one very famous sugar, glucose. It's the sugar that's produced in photosynthesis by mm -hmm. plants. Um, it's the sugar that's the main input for cellular respiration in your body. Um, really important for living things. Okay. We also have starches. Starches tend to be sugars that are found in plants. Okay. And they're actually sugars that, this is what we're getting at when we're talking about that energy storage. These are sugars that are being stored in plants. Yeah. Um, and then we also have things for structural support like cellulose. Mm -hmm. um, and cellulose is just a fancy way of saying fiber. Fiber. And there, and there are lots of other examples, um, but you just need to make sure you know your sugars, you know your structural components, you know um, short-term energy storage, and if you know that, you should be good to go. Okay, so let's dive a little deeper into some of the examples. 
So first we need to talk about the building block of carbohydrates. So what is their monomer? So the monomer of a carbohydrate is something called a monosaccharide, which is a mouthful. Yeah, it is. So let's break it down. So again, that prefix mono means one, and then this part saccharide means sugar. sugar. So it's one sugar. Oh, and another thing that. that we like to do is, let's make it as easy as possible. If you look at the word carbohydrate, it's the biggest word mm -hmm. for our macromolecules. There are only four of them. And believe it or not, monosaccharide happens to be the biggest um, monomer name. Yeah. So we're just going to attach the longest word to the longest word. So it's an easy um, memory clue to remember um, which monomer is uh, paired with which polymer. And what do we mean when we say monosaccharide? So here's an example. Each one of these individual ring structures that you see here is an example of a monosaccharide. But when we pair them together in a dehydration synthesis reaction or a condensation reaction, we're going to make something a lot more complex because we have many of them. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make a polymer. And that polymer could be cellulose. It could be um, any number of more complex sugars. And then down here at the bottom, you'll notice there are lots of other examples of mm -hmm. carbohydrates. So how are we going to classify these guys? Um, so they're going to be classified by the number of carbons that are in the molecule, as well as for the sugars that they end in. Okay. So um, names for sugars, what do they usually end in? So they usually end in os. So that's an easy way to remember it. So some examples, glucose. Fruc, tos, su, cross, and then we can go on and on and on and on. But those are all great examples. So if you ever get confused and you see the name of a molecule or a compound and you don't know what it is, look at the ending. If it's an os, what can you bet it's going to be? It's going to be a garb. All right, so we've talked a little bit about how to build compounds from monomers into polymers, but there are specific large carbohydrates um, or polysaccharides that we want to discuss. Um, and there's two in particular that are really important for living things. And these carbohydrates are used for that short-term energy storage that we were talking about before. Um, and those two carbohydrates are starch, which is found in plants, and glycogen, which is found in animals. So like, what are some places we might find these in plants and animals? So in plants, we tend to find starches in fruit structures, mm -hmm. um, structures that are used for storage. So for instance, if we think about tubers, like uh -huh. potatoes, um, they're rich in starch. They have lots of um, polysaccharides in them or mm -hmm. sugars in them, um, which makes sense because that's what they're used for, to store that for later. With glycogen, we tend to see glycogen in muscle tissue. Okay. But it's important to know the distinction that animals store sugars in the form of glycogen, plants store sugars in the form of starch. And there's two other main polysaccharides besides starch and glycogen that we want you to know about. And these are the polysaccharides that are used for structural Support. purposes. Yeah. The first one happens to be called cellulose, and we talked about that a little while before. Mm -hmm. um, cellulose uh, is a term that most commonly is called fiber. Okay. So if you think about what fiber is for, fiber is to help keep you, keep you moving, mm -hmm. keep you, make sure that you're a super highway so things don't stay too long inside your colon. Sweeps out that colon. That's right. And the reason why it's able to sweep out the colon is because our body actually doesn't have a means of breaking cellulose oh. down because structurally it's very hard to break. Okay. Um, and, and where is the cellulose coming from? Um, the cellulose is coming from smaller monosaccharides that are being built together, added on during dehydration synthesis reactions or condensation reactions that happen inside of plants. Okay. So it's found in plants, and in particular, it's found in one part of the plant. It's found in the plant cell walls mm -hmm. um, is where the cellulose is found. And yeah, we can't digest it. Um, is there anybody who can digest it? There are certain organisms that can, but they have a special digestive system that allows them to spend more time breaking it down. Mm -hmm. So ruminants are a good example. Very nice, like cows. Exactly. And then the next thing that we have is chitin, okay. not spelled the way it's pronounced. So chitin is also a structural um, sugar, and an example of chitin would be things that are found in exoskeletons. So right. for instance, insects, also lobsters are a great example. And because this is going to show up again specifically on the SOL, chitin is also found in the cell walls of one specific kingdom of life. And that's our fungi. So cellulose is found in the cell walls of plants, really important to know, mm -hmm. and chitin is found in the cell walls of fungus. Fun.
So here's a picture of um, how the cell walls and plants are built of cellulose. And what you'll notice is that cellulose is this enormous polysaccharide. Huge. Huge, made up of tons and tons of monomers, tons and tons of monosaccharides. But you'll notice that they're kind of all lined up in this really long, straight line. It's sort of unbranched is how we would describe it. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason that this is so great for plants is when you put a whole bunch of these cellulose molecules together, they stack up really nicely next to each other. So they're kind of like bricks. Yeah. Um, and because they stack up like that, they form this really sturdy structure. And it's really hard to break down, which explains why we can use it as fiber to help sweep out our um, lower digestive system. Right. The last macromolecule that we're going to be talking today about would be lipids. And if you'll notice these pictures, you'll notice that we have some um, larger things. Mm -hmm. And then we also have some things up at the top right-hand corner, things that you guys probably have heard in the news or if you paid attention in health class, things that probably should be limited in terms of your diet. So yeah. we're going to talk about um, lipids in general. Right, so let's talk about lipids and their structure. It looks like they have the same three things that carbohydrates have, which can be tricky. They do have those same three things, but don't let it deceive you. They are not going to be found in a one to two to one ratio. No. Instead, you're going to see a disproportionate number of carbons and hydrogens. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're going to have some oxygens. Oxygens are important. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have a disproportionate number of carbons and hydrogens because you're going to have this really long or these really long carbon tails that have a bunch of hydrogens coming off of them. And so what do we call them? We call them hydrocarbons. Very nice. And then with these hydrocarbons, we um, are going to form something that is a little bit deceiving. So the monomer of lipids aren't actually neat, tiny, small structures, but no. it's a bunch of these larger structures that are held together to form the polymer, which are larger examples of lipids that we'll talk about a little bit later. So what are the monomers of lipids? The monomers of lipids are triglycerides. triglycerides. And we're gonna show you a picture of triglyceride here in a second so that you guys can see what they actually look like. So here's an example of this long hydrocarbon tail that we talked about before mm -hmm. in the yellow. And then you'll notice that we have our oxygens up top in the head. So we have this interesting structure. We have these tails, and then we have the head at one far end, right? So we know that these guys are diverse groups. So mm -hmm. let's talk about all the diverse groupings like we did with our um, carbohydrates. So okay. what are the different types of lipids that we have? So there's fats, okay, as well as oils. Okay. As well as... Waxes. Waxes. As well as something called phospholipids. Ooh, that's a big one. We're we also have other things those. called um, steroids, oh, which you guys have heard probably of heard about. Um, and I think that covers it. Those are our five main categories of lipids. Mm -hmm. But regardless of which category we're talking about, we're still talking about carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. Mm -hmm. Makes sense because these guys are organic compounds. We're still talking about hydrocarbon chains. Um, so there are still some things that we still have in common. Right. Okay, so because lipids are mostly composed of these long hydrocarbon chains, they have some really unique properties. And the main one being that they are insoluble for the most part in water. So let's talk about what that means and why they would be insoluble. So in our last uh, set of notes, you guys remember that we talked about this concept of being insoluble, that water is in most part known as a universal solvent, but water can only dissolve things into itself if that thing has a charge. Right. So if lipids are insoluble, what does that mean about their hydrocarbon tails? It means that their hydrocarbon tails are non-polar. They do not have a charge on them. We can also say that they are hydro phobic because they hate water. They fear water. They're afraid of water. So in, in most cases, lipids and water always are going to separate. They're not going to want to be near each other because water doesn't know what to do with them. There's no charge. And so they're just going to be herded like we talked about in the previous video. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's talk about some of the main functions of lipids, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail about these. So one big one is we talked about before how carbs can be used for short-term energy storage, but mm -hmm. we would need something else if we wanted to save energy for a long time. And that something else is? Lipids. So they're going to be our energy storage molecule in the long term. Yeah. And the reason why we're going to want to store energy in the form of a lipid as opposed to a carb is that it's just, it's easier to carry because it weighs less, believe mm -hmm. it or not. 
People think of fat and they say, oh, fat weighs a lot, mm -hmm. but it's actually much more efficient to store extra energy in the form of fat than it is to carry it around in a carbohydrate. It could be pretty heavy. Yeah. Um, they're also used as a, a cushion, basically. Yeah. Most of your major organs in your body are surrounded by a layer of fat to protect them from impact. And as you get older and clumsier, you get more cushioning. <laughs> Um, and so the last thing that we can talk about is insulation. Mm -hmm. Which relates to one of our properties of life, yeah. right? So insulation helps to maintain our body temperature. And so organisms that live in environments where it's even more challenging to maintain your body temperature um, are going to have extra insulation. So That's for right. example, polar bears. Or whales or seals. Mm -hmm. So they'll have that layer of blubber, of lipids, of fats for extra insulation on their body. Yeah. That's probably a good question for a quiz. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Characteristic of life. Love it. All right, so let's talk about some lipid monomers. We've already talked about this a little bit. We said mm -hmm. that the lipid monomers are triglycerides. Mm -hmm. um, we also talked previously about how monomers are formed uh -huh. um, or how polymers are formed. In order to form these polymers, what do we have to do? We have to do a dehydration synthesis or condensation reaction. Yeah, and if you look at this picture, um, you'll notice that we have fatty acids here. So we have our fatty acids, which are basically these long hydrocarbon mm -hmm. tails. We're going to attach them to a glycerol head to form our triglyceride. Okay. So our triglyceride is a large structure, so our smallest structure is going to be the fatty acid attached to a glycerol head. Mm -hmm. But you'll notice when we do that, what are we removing? We're going to take off an H and an OH in order to make water. water. And what do we still need here, even though you don't see it? Even though you don't see it, to finish our triglyceride, you would need two more fatty acids and you would need to remove two more molecules of water to finish and make it a triglyceride. And remember, we also still need energy. And, and our good old friend, the enzyme. Enzymes. This isn't going to happen spontaneously. What's a good way to remember that fatty acids are a part of lipids? My favorite saying is, don't put your lipids on my fatty acids. Let's write that down. Don't put your lipids... On my fatty acids. On my fatty acids. So now we have two easy ways to remember um, our first two mono, uh, macromolecules of life, what their monomers are. So carbohydrates, we know longest word to the? Longest word. So carbs go to? Monosaccharide. And then for lipids, we know don't put your lipids on my? Fatty acids. So lipids go to? Fatty acids. And if I wanted to put a whole bunch of these fatty acids together, what kind of chemical reaction would I need? I would need a dehydration synthesis or condensation reaction. And what if I wanted to put a whole bunch of monosaccharides together? Oh my gosh, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. That's the great thing about macromolecules. If you learn the overall concepts, they apply to everything else. Right. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, we're going to focus in on this first class of lipids, the fats, and we're going to talk about two different types of fats that have some different chemical properties. The yeah. first kind is saturated fats. Now, saturated fats, here's the key. If we ask you to make a distinction between a saturated or an unsaturated fat, all you have to look for are the chemical bonds. Mm -hmm. The key with this word saturated is that they, they have as many hydrogens as they can mm -hmm. possibly have. They are saturated with hydrogens. Right. So to have as many hydrogens as you can possibly have, it means that you can only have single bonds because if you doubled up, you're losing a hydrogen to create that extra bond between carbons. Right. And because we only have single bonds, our, our fatty acid chains are all going to be very straight. And very long. And very long. Like this. And because of that, if you think back, we saw something similar in our carbs when we talked about it with cellulose. Because they're long and pretty regularly shaped, they stack up real nice together. So at room temperature, you should be able to observe and based on your observations, deduce whether or not you're dealing with something that's saturated or unsaturated. So for instance, let's talk about butter. Is butter a liquid or a solid at room temperature? Butter is a solid at room temperature. And if it's a solid, it means it must be able to stack nicely, mm -hmm. which means that its bonds must all be uniform, so which means... all single, which means that it has the full number of hydrogens, which means that butter is a... Saturated fat. Right. Now, but saturated fats are delicious, mm -hmm. but they're also problematic because they stack so nicely uh -huh. and they have a tendency to become solids... Unfortunately, they also have a tendency to become solids in 
your arteries. And that's when you have issues with blockages, which can cause heart disease and other major issues in the body. So as much as I like butter, your heart does not like it. No. Now that we talked about saturated fats, let's talk about unsaturated. So okay. we already know the only difference are the bonds. Right. So in unsaturated fats, we are going to have one or more double bonds. It's not going to be all single bonds between our carbons. And because of that, are we going to have the full number of hydrogen? No, we're going to be missing some hydrogens, but more importantly, because we're missing hydrogens and we have these extra bonds, that double bond actually physically changes the skeletal mm -hmm. backbone of the compound. So instead of having those kind of nice, regularly shaped fatty acid chains, what those double bonds do is they create these kinks and they make the chain kind of bend off a little bit. And you can see that right here. And when we have those kinks, what are they not able to do at room temperature? They are not able to stack up which means that unsaturated fats don't form solids at room temperature and they don't form solids in the body either. Right. So if you had to pick and choose a saturated versus an unsaturated fat, which one's a better deal for your money? Definitely going to be unsaturated fat. So an example would be something like olive oil. Ooh, nice. Yeah, which is liquid at room temperature because of those CC double bonds. All right, there's also this other category of fat you sometimes see on nutrition labels. They've been in the news a lot lately. Yeah, lots of things like to say that they have no trans fats. Right. It's this big thing that people want um, consumers to know about. Why is it? So un trans fats are fats that started off unsaturated, which remember is better for our body, but then um, synthetically or in a factory, they were, they were partially hydrogenated. So there were H's that were added back on, or hydrogens. So why do they do that? What's the, what's the purpose of doing that? It keeps things more stable at higher temperatures. Okay. That's, that's the main reason. Right, so if you think about like peanut butter, right? A lot of times if you buy peanut butter that has no trans fat, no hydrogenated oils, it's kind of liquidy when you first open you it. Butter really mix it. And some people don't like doing that, right? Um, so because of that, companies responded by putting these hydrogenated oils, these trans fats inside of it to keep it solid at room temperature. Yeah. And because it's more stable at room temperature, uh -huh. it also has a longer shelf life. Okay. So it has to do with keeping things mm -hmm. longer, things that have more preservatives in them, um, so that you don't have to go out and buy things over and over so that things don't go bad. So it has to do with basically making things easier for the consumer. Yeah. So even though they're easier in, in the ready future, in the near future, um, it's actually a problem because these aren't healthy things to eat. No. Um, if you think about why it's bad for you, you can think about our saturated fats and what they do inside of your body. Um, so remember we talked about how saturated fats, when you add back those hydrogens, when you give it that very regular shape, they're going to stack up more neatly, not only inside the peanut butter jar, but also inside of your arteries. All right, so the last type of lipid that we need to talk about is something called a phospholipid, which is probably the most important lipid that we're going to talk about today. And why is that? That's because phospholipids are the main component of your cell membrane. So every single cell in your body, the outside of the cell, the membrane is made out of these guys. And we're going to go into a lot more detail on them later in the year, but we want to give you a quick taste or introduction right now. Yeah, so the chemical structure of the phospholip is important because it dictates its chemical behavior. And its chemical behavior is important because basically these guys are the bodyguards of the cell. They decide right. what can come in and also what can leave. So the chemical structure is important. So let's talk about the two main parts of a phospholipid then. Okay, um, so when I first look at the phospholipid from here down, it's looking a lot like a triglyceride. Yeah. I see again down here, I see my fatty acid tails. But you'll notice that there's something weird about those two fatty acid tails. They uh -huh. don't look alike. No, they don't. One is straight, but one has a kink, kink. caused so, by a double bond. So one of them is saturated. And one is unsaturated. Unsaturated. So we have two fatty acid tails that make up a phospholipid. And then let's bump up to the top. At the very top, we have this unique structure, and this is mm. called a phosphate group. This is my phosphate group, also known as my glycerol head, if we wanted to call it that, right? So we still have a glycerol head, still have a phosphate group, and then we have two fatty acid tails. Now this, this chemical makeup is really important because mm -hmm. if you look at our phosphate group or our glycerol head, you'll notice that there's something unique about it. 
I see over here, I see charges. So this guy, this part of my phospholipid actually has a charge, or what can we say about it? We can say that it is polar. Very nice. But we all already know some basic things about lipids. What's mm -hmm. the most important thing that we know about them? We know that they are mostly nonpolar. Nonpolar. So one half of our phospholipid loves water. Uh-huh. It is hydrophilic. The other half hates water, and we've already come up with a term. It's hydrophobic. So you need to make sure that you understand the chemical composition of a phospholipid because it helps to explain how it's able to do its job in the body. Right. And you're going to see it again. And just to emphasize what a phospholipid is, we have a penguin. Uh huh. So it's like a penguin with a head that is polar or hydrophilic. And then we also have its rumpus. Its tail right there. Yeah. And its tail is? Hydrophobic. Hates the water. <laughs> so whenever you think about phospholipids, think about a penguin holding a wrench. Don't know why it's holding a wrench. <sighs> I don't know either. It's just, it's weird. It's off to work.